So my name is Sar. I'm 25 from Israel, uh, about nine hours uh, in time difference. So jet lag is still strong. And uh, I'm a C++ enthusiast in my spare time. Uh, quite ironically, I don't do any C++ at work. And I also like graphic design and video games. Uh, and perhaps a more relevant point is that I'm the implementer of C++20 concepts in the Clang compiler. And you can also come to my other talk on Wednesday, 3.15, to hear more about that story and how I got involved uh, in this. It's quite an interesting story. And in this talk, we're going to be talking about concepts. Um, concepts are a new feature, or is a new feature, in C++20, uh, which hopefully comes out next year. And first thing we should say about concepts is that it is a metaprogramming feature, OK? It allows you to write generic code in more ways. And the obvious question that comes to mind when you first hear, hear this is, should you even care about concepts if you're not writing some sort of generic library or the implementation of std sort, for example? And that comes up in all the examples of concepts. And the answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, no, no, just kidding. Um, so why should you care about concepts if you're not writing a generic library um, yourself? Well, if you're in this room or in this conference, you care about performance and or in this community at large. And metaprogramming can help you achieve optimal performance in many applications. Uh, it moves a lot of the, it can remove a lot of the overhead that um, some other constructs uh, in C++ can give. And, um, Really, uh, using the power of metaprogramming can help you achieve uh, excellent performance. Um, but still, you may not use metaprogramming in your uh, daily, everyday projects. And why is that? Well, um, some reasons I can think about why, well, why people would not use metaprogramming in, in their uh, daily project is that first, metaprogramming code is hard to write and debug. Um, it starts from the syntax, the template syntax, which can be some, sometimes very uh, uh, cumbersome to actually get right, and uh, through uh, error messages that are very long and unindicative. And also the fact that when you're writing uh, template code, you get no feedback on whether what you're writing is correct or not, as uh, opposed to, for example, writing normal typed C++. And once you get the code written and, it's wor and it works, uh, it's hard to read and reason about later by you or by um, um, the, your coworkers later. Um, and the third thing is that it is hard to compile. It takes a long time when you um, introduce a lot of template metaprogramming and can take a long time to compile such programs. So if all of these reasons exist and you are not using metaprogramming in your code today, why should you care about concepts which, makes, which adds more features to metaprogramming? Well, because concepts make metaprogramming easier to write and debug. They make it easier to read and reason about, and it makes them easier to compile. So basically, concepts, and I think the main feature of concepts is making metaprogramming more accessible and making it uh, easier to reason about and uh, usable by everyone. And I'm, trying to, I'm gonna try to prove this point. Um, well, and today we'll use concept to solve a very specific um, metaprogramming task, which I'm going to present in a minute. And we'll see that it's not that scary. And we'll see some cool things that can happen in a world where C20 concepts are here. And the task is going to be very specific, but the idea is not. You should, what you should get from this is uh, see um, this task and how easy it is to, uh, to do. And uh, if you have an idea how to implement metaprogramming in your specific project, you should know that now, with C++20 concepts, it's not that hard, and you should go and do it. So this is, the very, this is how we're going to do it, basically. And quick disclaimer about this talk, I'm going to be some, doing some live coding. I'm not going to do all coding live, uh, but I'll try to get as much as I can. Cool. So uh, what we're going to try to do is write the basis for a game engine. And I'm going to be more specific. We're going to write a very simple uh, component messaging system. It's going to be um, some sort of hierarchy of components which send and receive messages from one another. Okay? Um, I'll see, I'll show you a quick example. For example, say we have this TikTok component here. Uh, this is a tree of components. Each uh, square here is a component. This TikTok component will try to send down messages and, and find responders down the tree. This idle component does nothing, just 
there for the sake of it. And responders are gonna receive tick messages from TikTok and respond with talk messages. Let's see how it works. For example, TikTok receives a start message, then send down a tick. The message comes to a responder, which responds with a talk. And TikTok uh, says talk. And then it reaches the other responder, which also responds with a talk, causing a second talk to be printed. This is a very uh, simple um, uh, little messaging uh, scenario we want to support. So a straightforward implementation for this is going to use uh, virtual calls and RTTI. Let's see how it works. Um, say you have this component-based class that, that shows you um, how um, th that's going to be the base class for all components. First thing it's going to have is this handle function, which is going to be virtual, pure virtual. It's going to take a base message uh, reference and uh, handle it, whatever that means for the specific component. And it's going to have a vector of pointers to children. Notice that we're using a pointer here because um, component is a polymorphic type, so we have to store it by pointer. Uh, we can use unique pointer here because we can say that all components own their children and make this a little bit easier to manage resource-wise. We also need a parent link uh, so that we can send messages up the tree and not just down the tree. And in order to send down a message, we take the message, we iterate over the children, for each one of them, let them handle the message, and then propagate the message down from that, child, from that specific child. And when we want to send a message up, we just check if we have a parent. If we don't, we are the root and we can stop. Um, and we can just let the parent handle the message and send up the message from the parent. Very similar. Um, and how would we write um, the actual components? We can have this um, component-based class. Um, that I'm not going to show the implementation of it. What, what it basically does was, is receive a list of message types that you want to handle, and it exposes virtual functions that you can override to handle these specific functions. For example, here, uh, TikTok says that it wants to handle start messages and talk messages, and then to, on, in order to hand, handle them, they can, it, can, it can just uh, override handle for start and handle for talk. Okay. And then here it prints out tick, sends down a tick, the tick goes down to responder, which handles the tick, and sends up this talk, which is printed out uh, in this component, okay? Um, I'm not gonna show the implementation of this, but uh, it, it's uh, very similar, to, for example, to a visitor uh, implementation. Okay, so let's see how this works. Um, Excuse me. Okay, so I have a local instance of Compiler Explorer here, and on the right I'm gonna show you uh, the program output. This is not the compilation output, but the actual output of the program. And I have this code here from the slides, uh, and I've set up this uh, tree that we saw in the animation over here, and we can see what happens when we let the top component handle uh, the start message. And we can see that what's printed is tick, talk, talk. Okay, so pretty cool. Uh, this works, um, but let's see the assembly that's being generated for this thing. Um, well, the first thing you can see is that it is a bunch of assembly, uh, and a few, thing we can, we can, a few things we can see here is the type information stored for all our polymorphic types, that's RTTI. Um, we can see if you go all the way to the top, we can see we have dynamic allocation because we're using polymorphic types and we need to allocate stuff on the heap. And we can see that, um, for example, let's see the code that's being generated for this uh, handle thing here. And we can see that this is a virtual call. We cannot see the name of the function here because this is an indirect call, okay? so. We can see that uh, this solution works, but it generates uh, suboptimal assembly, and basically the compiler is unable to see through all this virtual uh, things that happen, and is basically unable to optimize this very simple code. This code should just print out four strings, three strings, and it does all of, the, all of this uh, work. And what I'm gonna try to do today is try to take, um, take advantage of the fact that in this specific scenario, we know that the structure of the tree at compile time. 
and try to make, make it so that the compiler can see through um, all of this virtual uh, uh, handling. And for example, when we send down the tick message below here, it's going to resolve the destinations of this message at compile time. It's going to know which, know the structure of the tree at compile time and know which components down the tree will handle this message and directly call them. It's going to be, um, uh, and then hopefully the compiler will be able to optimize this a little bit better. Okay? So this is what, I, what we're going to try to do. And uh, let's start. And the first thing we're going to start and try to do is eliminate, the way we're going to try to do this is try to eliminate the things that make this uh, dynamic and um, uh, runtimey. Okay? And the first thing we're going to try to eliminate is this vector of children. Um, this is a vector of unique pointers. And the first thing we can see that vector is a dynamically sized container. So we cannot know at compile time the size of this vector. So we need to replace this with something uh, whose size we know at compile time. And also, it doesn't know the types of its children because they are all this polymorphic component-based class. And we can't know the type of the specific child that interests us. So we're going to replace this with something that is fixed size and knows the types of each of its children independently. And that is a tuple. Okay? So let's include tuple. And um, over here, replace this with a tuple of children. Uh, we're going to need the actual uh, types of the children. So let's receive them here as template parameters. I'm going to use the uh, trailing underscore to signify template parameters. And cool. And here, if we wanted to iterate over the children, we can do a bunch of things. Um, we can actually use Boost HANA, which has, which is a cool little library, header-only library that allows you to do some manipulation on um, generic types. For example, you could use HANA for each and give it a generic lambda here. For example, you can give it auto uh, child reference and just have the body of the loop as usual. And it's going to work like you would expect. I don't have HANA right now, but uh, this will work. Cool. So now we need to replace this parent. And here we run into a bit of a uh, problem. And why is that? Um, parent, we need to know the type of parent in order for the, all this to be runtime, uh, to be compile timing. Okay? And in order to know the type of the parent, we're going to have a problem because the parent needs to know the type of us because we are its children. We have this cycle of dependency where the parent needs to know our type and we need to know its type. Um, so this kind of breaks our approach here of trying to converse the, convert this directly. In runtime, we handle this by having a pointer, and in runtime, changing the pointer to point to something else, but this is not going to work over here. So let's see what we can do to fix this. Um, excuse me. Wait. Okay, so the idea we're going to try to use is... Um, because we have this cyclic dependency, we're going to do an alternative approach to this whole thing, okay? We're going to have, um, instead of each component knowing its children and then having a link to its parent, we're going to have the entire tree as a separate um, data structure and just pass the tree around to the handler functions. If, if a handler function wants to send a message, it will receive a copy of the tree, a reference to it, and will receive the location of it in the tree right now. And given the location and um, the tree, it can send the message down. Let's see how it looks. For example, I'm going to have this data structure uh, tree here, and the TikTok component will receive, um, in, instead of just, wait, instead of just the message, it's going to receive um, a reference to the tree and a location inside the, this tree. And if you know the, the tree and the location inside of it, you can send the message from there. You just have the message, and you send the message from that location in the tree. So the send down message, the send down uh, function will now receive uh, the tree, the location, and the message to send. Okay, this little change of of, uh, of a method here will help us make this static in the in the in later on. The responder will be similar when it tries to send up a message. We can do uh, make this a little nicer and package a reference to the tree plus a location inside of it inside of an object. I'm going to call this context. Okay. And making this static 
is going to require us, basically, this context now, now that it's static in compile time, it's going to know the types of the things, the type of the tree and the location inside of it at compile time. So it can no longer be a specific type here, okay? It has to be, it has to change according to the tree and according to the location inside of it. So this, these two functions will become templates, okay? And, well, th this is a bit of annoying because these handle functions are just plain functions. And basically, now they've become these templates that we know nothing about. We know nothing about what this context object really is, what its interface is. We don't, we, this no, no longer looks like a very uh, simple uh, function like it used to. And this is the sort of thing you try to, you start to get into when you try to do template metaprogramming. And this is a bummer. And let's see how concepts can help with this. Um, let's see. Cool. So I'm back in Compiler Explorer. And uh, let's see how we can use concepts to make this a little bit better. And the first thing we can do is remember how I said um, where this, these, two, these functions no longer look like uh, simple, uh, normal functions, but look like templates, even though when you call them, you call them with just two arguments, and the call to them looks like a very simple function. They no longer look like this. Uh, we can use the first new feature of C++20 concepts, which is the abbreviated template syntax. We can basically drop this whole template head over here, and instead of writing context uh, the name of the template parameter, we can simply write auto. Uh, by the way, this is uh, compiling using my um, Clang implementation on, on, the, on the right here. And so you can see um, how this compiles uh, and, and everything uh, in, uh, later. So this, this looks a bit better. Um, because this now looks, again, like a normal function. And the fact that context can change types here is more of an implementation detail than a, an actual property of the function. It looks exactly the same, and it behaves exactly the same. So it should look like a normal function. And we can, another cool thing we get here is that we don't we no longer need to invent these annoying uh, temp names of template type parameters that, whose only job is to be in one specific place. And nobody likes these, so we no longer need to make up these names. Just write auto. So this solves one of the problems, but um, another problem still remains. We don't know nothing about these context objects, right? We don't know the interface of these are, and, and actually, they can really be anything. It's not that just we don't know it, the compiler doesn't know it as well. And for example, if we take a TikTok component here and let it handle, um, let it handle a start message, for example, with a context that is an integer, this is going to fail. Why? Because it tries, it's, it's trying to call um, send down on an int, and it doesn't work. Okay. So the function itself doesn't really have an information about what can it receive here. So in order to solve this, we can use the second new feature of I'm, I'm using an arbitrary uh, num numbering here. There's no actual like uh, list ordered list of, of features. Um, here's another feature of C++20 concepts, which is the concept. It's a new type of thing you can define in C++20. The way you do it is just write a uh, list of template parameters followed by the keyword, new keyword concept. And here you write the name of the concept. For here I'm gonna use context. I'm gonna use um, camel case for concept names to distinguish them from, for example, we're gonna have the context template. Uh, I wanna distinguish the type from um, the concept, even though Standard library concepts are going to be lowercase. Uh, here we're going to use um, camel case. Cool. And here we can write any sort of uh, compile time condition. Okay. For example, we can do a very simple condition and require that size of t is equal to one. Okay. So what, what's what's all the fuss about, right? This is just this is equivalent to writing a context for a bool context and, uh, and this, this looks very similar, right? So what's, what's this whole fuss about concepts? Well, with C++20, you can use a concept in more ways than you can just use another, uh, just any other uh, variable. You can actually, wherever you can write the keyword auto, you can prefix the keyword auto with the name of a concept. For example, here I can write context. And the way it's gonna work now is that 
the compilation is going to fail at the call site to handle here. Okay? It's going to tell you, if we take a look at the compiler output here, it's going to tell you that you cannot call handle because int does not satisfy context. Okay? Um, placing a concept name in front of auto will mean that the type deduced for that auto must match the concept uh, that you, you write there. Okay? And it's going to explain why it doesn't match the concept uh, because, for example, here you need size of int to be one and it's not, it's four. Okay? So here um, we actually, we don't, not only do we actually know something about, concept, about the context here, we actually, uh, it is actually enforced by the compiler. And we can get uh, better er error messages and earlier uh, than you could before. Um, cool. But um, we can also use this in other places here, for example, and here, wherever you can use auto and have the same effect. But this uh, definition of context is not very uh, useful, right? This is not what we want a context to be. So let's see what we do want a context uh, to be. Um, okay. So a context, as we've said, is just a simple pair of tree and a location inside this tree, okay? So what we do need is, is a, some time of compile time static tree and a, tr a compile time tree location, okay? So um, if we're gonna try to imagine how it's gonna look, it's gonna be this context object with a, a tree template parameter and a tree location template parameter. It's gonna store a reference to that tree and location like we saw before in the dynamic uh, version. And it's gonna have the send down and send up uh, functions like we saw before. So maybe we can use this sort of um, uh, outline of how context looks to actually define the context concept better. Let's see. Um, okay, so here I have the, um, uh, the thing I showed you from the slides, the outline of the context uh, template and I'm gonna try to define the context concept um, more accurately, and the, the most, a very accurate way I can put it is that context is any specialization of that template, right? Have the context template over there. Anything that's a specialization of this is a context in my book. So I pre-prepared this is specialization of the type trait here, um, which means what you think it means. You give it a template and a type, and it t tells you whether or not um, this type is a specialization of that template. So I can use is specialization <coughs> of um, V and give it context and context and T, excuse me. So now we have this, um, now we have this uh, concept actually defined more accurately, okay? Um, okay, so, but now if we look at the actual context template, we still have the problem we have with the functions. Uh, we don't know anything about this tree thing and about this tree location thing. They're just type names. They could be anything. They are duct typed, um, basically. So another feature we can use is simply replace type name with the name of another concept. For example, here I can define the tree concept. Leave this true for now. Anything can be a tree. And replace this type name with tree. Okay. In order to actually define this tree, I'm gonna to have to actually write uh, a tree template and how it's gonna look like we studied back in Computer Science 101. Uh, we need to write a tree, you need the root and the list of children. Cool. But here we have the same problem, right? We have type name here. And once you tr start to replace type names by concepts, it's a very addictive thing. You're gonna wanna eliminate all type names from your project. So let's uh, replace this. And what do we want here? We want some sort of node concept, right? So let's write one. Um, I'm not sure what, what I'm gonna require of a node to be, but I'm gonna start with something relatively simple and for example, require that it is not, for example, a reference or some weird uh, type that I cannot move around and handle. Uh, there's a type tree for this, which is called is object. So basically, a node is anything that's basically it's not a, a reference, for example, okay? And here I can write node instead of type name. And what are the children? Well, 
if you think about it, the children are trees themselves, right? Because we want this tree to have multiple levels. Uh, so we need this tree concept over here and just write it here, tree. Um, and now we have the children. Um, cool. And how is this going to look? We're going to store the root. And we're going to store a tuple of children. Cool. And now we can actually use this tree type here. For example, tree of int. Tree of int is a, is a simple uh, um, tree with an int at the top and an int below it. And now we want, for example, to return the tree that is the child of the root tree. How do we do it? We use to get to access the first child of the children tuple. Okay, then we need the root of that. And this works. Um, pretty cool, but this whole syntax of accessing a child is pretty annoying, right? Having to wrap this all, all the time with std get. Um, let's do something, a little convenience function that is going to help us um, access children a little bit easier. Um, the way we're going to do it is write a child function. This is going to receive uh, as an argument uh, the size, the index of the child, okay? And it's going to uh, not receive any arguments, and it's going to return to get with that index of uh, children. Just a simple wrapper here. And for the return type of this, we can just, uh, we could, for example, go and fetch the specific type of this specific child here and write it as the return type, but it's easier to just write auto here and use auto type deduction um, to infer the return type of this, okay? Well, the first thing you might notice is that this function child um, is a bit confusing because it doesn't return the child, but it returns the tree, okay? It doesn't return a node, but returns a tree. And this can be a little bit confusing. If you look at this signature here, there's no re really easy way to tell whether this, re this uh, returns a tree or a node. And it's a very confusing interface. So we can use another feature. Well, it's the same feature we used before of C++ 20 concepts and actually write the name of a concept in front of an auto return type. For example, here I can write tree. And now, when looking at the interface, I know what this returns, even though I don't know the specific type, but I know enough to actually figure out what this is trying to do. Cool, let's use this instead of uh, this here. Use child, zero, give it nothing, and uh, get the first child. If you want child number one, we can do Okay, so this doesn't compile, and if we can see the error message we get, it is pretty uh, long. And uh, we can actually salvage a specific line that tells us what the problem is uh, here. Okay, it says the tuple index is out of range. But this is very uh, typical of uh, template metaprogramming error messages. They're basically a well of text in which you have a very specific line, in the, in the best case, you have a very specific line that tells you what exactly went wrong, and you got to get into the ver weird implementations of tuple here, okay? So how can we improve this error message? We can basically use uh, another feature of C20, the requires clause. Requires clause is another thing you can add right after the template parameter list. Here I can uh, go ahead and write the requires keyword, another new keyword. And then I need to write some sort of condition, okay? For example, here, I'm going to require that index uh, is smaller than the number of children. And now, the error message I'm getting is much shorter. And what it's telling me is that you cannot call child with one because one should be smaller than the number of children, and it's not. Okay? So I get this error, messages, error message earlier, and it's more concise and uh, descriptive of what the actual problem is. So this is pretty nice, and I can uh, fix my code here easily. And the error messages pop where in your code and not the library code. So this is pretty nice. Um, let's go ahead and write some sort of constructor for this uh, tree, okay? A very simple constructor I can think of is a default constructor. Of course, we can just do it like this. Um, but let's do another, a little more sophisticated uh, constructor here. For example, I can use a constructor that constructs the root node. How would I do that? I would just accept the root node here and initialize it like this. 
and I'm done, right? Well, there is a problem in this constructor, and uh, it's a very uh, well-known problem that um, there is an extra copy here, okay? Then, then the root node is copied inside the parameter and then copied back into the uh, root object there, the root field. And the, um, the textbook way to solve this would be a forwarding reference, right? I can just do, the extra copy is also problematic if, if for example, root is not copyable. I can uh, write template type name. Root arg, for example, oh, sorry. And here, write, I need to use a universal reference, root arg ref ref here. And here I need to use std forward, uh, give it root arg, and initialize root. Uh, this is a very uh, common idiom in C++ using the forwarding reference. Well, the first thing I don't like about this is uh, this is the, the template over there, which is kind of weird. I can just remove it and use auto, like we said before. Here I need the actual type, so I can use decal type root. Um, okay, but there's another fundamental problem with this constructor. Can anybody see it? Well, what happens if I take this tree and try to initialize it as a copy of another tree? Well, I'm getting an error message, even though I didn't do anything to disable the copy constructor. Um, and the error message is that it is trying to initialize root from the tree I gave it to copy, okay? What's, what's the problem here, basically, is that this constructor here basically accept any argument you would give it, right? This auto ref ref will accept basically anything. And when you try to use the copy constructor, it actually uh, takes, it, it takes precedence over the copy constructor and actually um, uh, disables it, effectively disabling, disabling the copy constructor. So what can we do here to make, to solve this problem? Well, I would, and I would actually don't want anything, I don't want all arguments to actually get into this root argument of the constructor. I want just the things that are root-like, right? I want root and maybe a reference to root and a const root or something like that. Things that are actually root and not just anything like this, that like the language has allowed us to specify before. So what I can do here is use concept. I can actually place here the name of a concept to constrain the, thing that, the things that enter this root, and let's see how it looks. For example, the, the most accurate thing to do here would be require that um, the thing we get is either root or const root or root reference or const root reference. I'm gonna do a, something a little bit simpler for this de demonstration and use std uh, convertible to, which is a standard concept. So it comes with the standard library. I need to include the concepts header. And here I can write convertible to root. And now this compiles, okay? And I can use the copy constructor. And even more than that, I can actually know that the things I'm expecting here are actually only root and it's uh, similar um, things. Cool, and now let's go ahead and try to define the tree concept, okay? We have the tree template. We need to define the tree concept. And the way we defined the tree concept before, the, the, for example, the context concept, if you remember, we just use a specialization of, right? And used here tree and t. But the problem here is that tree is not defined yet, right? And if you were to try to move this below the definition of tree, we'd get an error that says, here we're trying to use the tree concept and it's not defined yet. So we have this problem in trying to define the concept this way that we cannot use the concept in the definition itself this way because we have this cyclic dependency. So let's see how we can actually define this a little bit better. Um, okay, so there are a couple different ways to, that, to, ways to actually define a concept for, a t for this template. The first is this, the one we saw before, the very easy solution. 
uh, just say that it's a specialization. This is, uh, this is a mistake over there. It should be tree and T. And the solution is pretty accurate, right? We do really want specializations of tree to be considered trees. But there's some downsides. For example, it requires some template metaprogramming to actually write down the is specialization of the type trait, which is not non-standard. Uh, let's say you don't care about this. It's a, just a little bit of a template metaprogramming. But uh, another problem is that this is not easily extensible. For example, if you want to write another tree uh, template which satisfies tree, you cannot. And um, another thing that makes this irrelevant in our case is that you cannot use the concept in the class itself. So this is out of the, this is out of the question. Another thing you can do is cheat and basically define this empty base class, tree base, inherit from, from it in the, inside the template and use it to define the concept like this. Okay? Well, th th this works, but um, it's, it's probably the easiest way out of this uh, problem here. Um, it's probably fastest to compile because only, the only thing you need to check is, the, is that um, tree, the, the type you gave it has a tree based space. But uh, a few downsides is that it is inaccurate and um, for example, another thing can accidentally inherit from tree base and you get a weird error and that this is a hack, um, sort of trying to uh, cheat the, uh, the concept system by, give, by using the tools that we have. And it's not actually semantically defining what a tree is, but just a hack, which uh, probably will not give us uh, very useful error messages down the line. And there's actually another uh, caveat to this, which we'll see later in the talk. But there's another way to define a concept using a new type of expression in C20 um, called the requires expression. A requires expression um, is a new form of expression that's written as the requires keyword followed by a list of parameters like you would in a function. They can be any, t any type that you want. Then in, a, in curly brace, and then a list of things that you want to hold for this type. The way you read a requires expression is, say that I have a T of type capital T, then I want t.root to be a valid expression and for the type of this expression to satisfy node, okay? This is how you read this requirement. And you can just do a list of requirements here, a bunch of different requirements you can use in a requires expression. And well, let's see what, what, what you can say about this solution. The, the obvious upside here is that it is extensible. You can write different implementations of tree and it's gonna uh, work fine. Another thing is that we can use this in the class, in the template itself, we can use it in the definition. Um, pro pro possible caveat to this is uh, the don't repeat yourself principle because you're actually defining the interface of tree twice. You're defining it once in the concept and once in the template. Um, this I'm not sure is uh, quite a caveat, another not, not so sure about um, the performance of this. How long does it take the compiler to actually com uh, com check for these? And another caveat here is that it is harder to write a concept correctly. Before you couldn't get it wrong, right? Like you, you define the concept to be anything that is a tree. But here you could get it wrong. You, you could do something in the concept that makes specific instantiations of tree not be a tree. Uh, so you can have problems here. But this is actually quite of an upside as well. It lets you, it enforces you to actually think about the interface your class is exporting and, and define it in, in a very concise and um, uh, de definitive way and define the semantics of it. And also, concepts are code. And being code, they can be tested. So let's see how we can test our tree concept and expand it a little bit. So here I have the thing from the slides, and below the tree concept, the tree template, I've written a few tests. For example, a static assert, uh, the tests are simple static asserts. I assert that tree uh, of int is a tree, okay? And I assert that, for example, if it has a child, it is a tree as well. Just two simple tests, okay? Uh, and it's important to do these tests because otherwise you're gonna get uh, errors uh, down the line and, you're, and, and you, it would it'd be difficult to trace back that the problem is that your concept is incorrect. Um, 
Okay, and let's try to expand this. For example, let's say that I also don't want only dot root to be valid. I actually want, for example, to express the dot child um, uh, interface that we've written earlier, okay? So let's say I want t.child0 to be val a valid expression. If I want just something to be a valid expression, I can just write it uh, like this. You actually need the template keyword here because this is a, a, a template uh, type, t. And I want this to be a valid expression. I don't need the curly braces if I just want it to be a valid expression. Cool. Child, uh, well, now let's see. And this actually breaks one of our tests. Why is that? Because tree of int, let's see the output. Well, tree of int does not satisfy tree anymore. Actually, if you write a concept in a static assert, uh, I will actually explain wh why the static assert failed and why the concept is not satisfied. Here, I, um, tree of int does not satisfy tree because you cannot call t.child0 on it. And why is that? Because it does not have any children, okay? So, we basically made a mistake while defining our concept this way. So we need to actually go, go back and try to refine this concept and define it more uh, accurately so that it actually models the behavior in case of, for example, a tree with just one node in the root. So how are we gonna do that? Well, one thing to go about this is actually to expose the number of children from this. Let's say I need a static const expert size t child count and let it be the size of children, the number of things the children has. And here, I can also, um, for example, say that I need there to be a child count. It needs to be convertible to size. Make sure that you prefer to use convertible to over, for example, same as, which is another concept, because, for example, here, child count is a const size t. You may, may, it may cause you problems if you just say it must be size t. So convertible to size t is probably enough. And here I want to, let's say I want this to be a, a, probably of the, of the uh, type. And here I want to uh, require, I can use another requirement type which is basically says, if I just write the keyword requires and then I can follow it by uh, some sort of condition, okay? So for example here I can write the condition that I want to hold. What I want to hold is that child count is either zero, and if it is not zero, then I want this to be a valid expression, this uh, child zero to be a valid expression, and the way I would do that is just use another requires expression here and place it inside. Cool, and now my tests pass. Um, the, the point here is that now this concept actually reflects better uh, the way this tree behaves. If its child count is zero, then we don't need any children and it's, it's valid to, invalid to actually try to access them. Uh, but here is, it defines the behavior a lot more accurately. Cool. So, um, excuse me. So, okay, so now, right now we're gonna try to move on, okay? And we'll skip over uh, the tree location implementation due to the lack of time. And um, I have here, uh, I've also refined the context concept and defined it in a similar way to I, the way I, wait, I don't see it. I've actually gone, gone ahead and defined the context concept in a similar way using requires expressions. And uh, you can see that I'm requiring there to be a uh, dot tree for a context. And I require that if you take dot tree, and take the type of it and remove the reference, then this should be a tree, because this should be a reference to a tree. And also they're required to be there to be a dot location, which is a tree location. Cool. Um, let's now try to write send up, okay? Um, the thing that sends a message up the tree. First thing it's gonna have to, to accept is a message. So let's write the message concept real, real quick. Let's say it's an object as well. And here I'm gonna accept some sort of message. Cool, the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to check is whether I am the root or not, okay? 
If I'm the root, I don't need to do anything. And if I'm not the root, I need to send a message up the tree. I'm going to do an if const expert here and then check whether I'm not the root. I'm going to do location the root, I guess. Um, well, I'm actually not sure this is the interface to check whether you are root or not. So I need to actually go ahead and go to the um, implementation of the uh, tree location concept and see what the interface is. And I can go here and see that it, it actually is root. That is the function I want to call here, the property I want to check. So I need to use is root instead of root. And here, I want to actually get the actual parent node and check whether it accepts my messages or not. So I need to actually access my tree in a specific tree location, right? So how do I do that? Well, I'm not sure. Let's see if tree has some sort of thing that can help me. Well, there's this subtree function here, which accepts a location and returns a tree reference. It's pretty, pretty obvious what it does for just looking at the signature. And just write subtree here. Well, this is kind of annoying. Having to go through, writing generic code like this is kind of annoying and you don't really, still don't really know what's the interface of the thing you're, the thing you're handling. You can go and check it by going to the actual concept and verifying uh, what the, what's the interface is, but it's still a lot of manual work and doesn't feel like normal programming. And it would be very nice if our, for example, our IDE could actually show us what the interface of the generic type is because now it can know it uh, actually by checking the concept. And why doesn't it work here? Why don't we get autocompletion here? Well, because this is not an IDE, right? This is Compiler Explorer. Um, let's move to another, to add an actual IDE. So actually for this presentation, I've collaborated with JetBrains to bring a very experimental first version of concept support in C Lion. And let's see how it works. Um, for example, this send up message here receives a message auto message. And here I want to check whether, whether or not I am the root. And I can actually get auto completion right here in the concept uh, usage, in the generic type usage. Yeah, pretty cool. And let's go ahead and continue to write this function. For example, I can uh, do tree dot and get the interface of tree. I know that it has a subtree that accepts a location and I can give it our location. I need not, not to give it the location of us, but of our parent, right? Because we want the parent node. So how do we do that? We do location dot of parent. And this returns a tree, so we need to get the root of it. And we have a node reference parent here. Cool. Now we can actually um, check whether the parent handles a message or not. The thing we would want to check is whether a uh, parent has a function called handle with a specific parameter type. But there is no actual way to check whether it has the function or not. The only thing we can check is whether an expression is valid or not. So if the thing we're going to check is whether parent.handle is a valid expression or not. And how do we do that? Using a requires expression. You can actually check whether parent.handle of message is valid or not. And if it is, I can actually call it and, prop and let it handle the message. And after I call the, the thing, I need to actually propagate the message down. So I need a new context object with a new location. The way I'm going to do it is actually use class template argument deduction. I'm just going to call this constructor here with uh, the proper tree and location and let it deduce the type of the context itself. And I'm going to use the same tree and a location of the parent. Okay? And use send up. I'm going to actually store this in a variable. Cool, and another thing we need is that handles can actually receive the context itself. So if um, parent.handle um, message and parent context is valid, we 
we want to actually um, uh, just let it uh, have the context and not propagate it ourselves. And if none of these apply, we just want to send the message up and ignore the parent. Cool, so this is send up. Let's write send down. Um, this is gonna be pretty similar, so I'm gonna just copy over this part here. Um, I'm gonna replace parent with child. Um, we need to replace of parent with of child. Right. And we need to give it an index of a child to handle. Uh, in order to do this, we actually need um, um, a size constant. <coughs> we need to, uh, some way to invoke, for example, if I have this lambda here with child index, which is some sort of uh, compile time known uh, integer constant. And I can just use it here. But I need a way to invoke this lambda with numbers from zero to the number of children minus one. The way I can do this is use uh, another uh, cool trick with boost HANA. You just, for example, fetch my current uh, uh, tree uh, using tree.subtree at the current location. And then current dot uh, child count is actually a HANA uh, constant, which means I can do I can do child count times this lambda with index. The cool trick in the HANA in the HANA library. So let's go here. Cool. And I need to call send up and not send down here. And this is it. Wait, here I need to capture this tree. We need the tree. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see if this compiles. Wait. Hmm, wait, I need to accept the message here. So this works, but doesn't do anything since we haven't sent down the message yet. I have this tree written out here. Just need to send down, need to create a new context here, context of a tree, and just send down a start message. And this works. As you can see, it prints, I'm not sure if you can see this, but this prints out the same output we got from the dynamic, uh, the dynamic version. And let's see, we can actually do something a little cooler, and uh, since we've checked for valid expressions here, okay, we can actually do more complex handlers. For example, go to the idle component and let it handle any message by just writing this generic handler, okay? So this handle now handles any message that passes through it. You can, for example, uh, print out a dot whenever an idle receives a message. And another cool thing I can do is write another more specific handler that handles all messages whose size is more than one and writes, uh, for example, a, an exclamation mark. And concepts will actually know to, to pick the more specific handler here, okay? Because it knows that this function here is defined is as, as much constrained as this function. It also re requires a message, but also requires more stuff. So it's actually gonna pick this function and use it to handle larger messages. So if we run this again, we can see um, that we actually get exclam exclamation points here. Um, Yeah, the dots are not showing up. Wait. Size of, yeah, excuse me, I need size of message, yeah. Thank you. And now you can see that it prints out a dot whenever it gets a small message such as start and prints out an exclamation mark when it gets a large message such as talk, which has an int in it. Well, we did all this to get a better uh, optimization from the compiler, right? Let's see how it does. Let's just paste the code here. Uh, 
And as we can see, it compiles down to just simple calls to put S without any, um, without any uh, trees or anything. Just compiles down to the calls to put S. And that has been a day in the life with C++ 20 concepts. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. No, it has to be. A, uh, it's a property of some type or some collection of values, so it has to be. Uh, the question was whether you can use a concept without uh, the template parameter list above it. Yeah, you can do that. For example, convertible2 takes two arguments, uh, the type, a type and a type it wants to convert to, and checks whether you convert t to u, for example. You can do any number of uh, template parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, um, this, in this case we knew the tree compile time, is it generalizable to the case where we don't? Or some have some hybrid thing where we know some of the tree or something. Uh, actually, this is based off a project of mine I did, and here, there I do have some uh, handling of the case where you know, you know some of the tree at compile time, but it, uh, it's outside the scope of this uh, talk, but it is simple. We can talk about it later if you want. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can, but you cannot replace it like you would a type. You cannot just replace the type with a value concept. You have to require that the concept holds for that value, but you can write value concepts as well. It's just you don't have the shorthand syntax for it because it's, because it's less uh, useful. In the performance? Well, I think here you saw a difference in performance. I think that the, like concepts do not enable you, uh, well, they do, but um, you can still, you, you can, they enable you to write generic code. The question is whether you have performance benefits from concepts. Well, uh, not directly, but they help you write, um, for example, code like this more easily, which does generate much faster binaries in specific, in, in relevant cases. So not directly, but indirectly. Okay, so the question is, uh, what's different in compilation times um, between concepts and, for example, enable if? Uh, I haven't done measurements myself, uh, but like the, the most, the, the place where concepts would give you a, a boost was, is where you use libraries which extensively use concept for, for example, ranges. Right now, if you use ranges v3, they already have replacements for concepts which use, for example, type traits and old uh, variants of this. And using this language feature is gonna compile them much faster. And um, like using the language feature is much faster than using uh, uh, hacks that imitate it. Um, 
So that, that is like the best performance uh, in compile time is you're going to get for prob probably. So Andrew Sutton said, um, Eric Niebler, writer of ranges, uh, reported 30% increase in compile times, uh, like in increase in performance of compile times, 30% less, with concepts over, uh, with concepts over uh, uh, type traits. So cool, cool statistic. So yeah, another testament of about a third increase in uh, performance with concepts. It's an interesting question, I'm not sure. But it has to generate less, less types, so probably. Um, when, when will the Clang version be shipped? Yeah, so um, right now I'm working on, uh, um, like the entire feature is implemented and I'm solving bugs, so, um, but it's gonna take some time. I can't, I can't uh, um, like tell you a date, but I'm working on it. Um, why is concepts not an extension of the type system in a metaprogramming feature? Well, uh, it's, it's, well it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, how you call it, but um, the thing I meant was that it allows you to write generic code in more ways. Um, it's not really an extension of the type system, not, I'm not sure, uh, but it is, it is an extension of the template um, uh, mechanism. Um, another disclaimer, uh, the JetBrains uh, integration uh, feature uh, is very experimental, and it's not probably going to not be available in the uh, next early access, but you can go talk to JetBrains people about it. It would be cool. Yeah. I can't hear you, sorry. Can you speak up? I'm not sure if I understand the question, but you're asking if you can use this to eliminate the fake parameters used to distinguish uh, constructors, for example. You can actually use, okay, uh, I think I understand the question. You can actually use concepts for partial specializations as well and constrain them for specific sets of types. You can do a partial specialization of hash, for example, and require some things on the template parameters. And I think that answers your questions. Um, I think Bjarne's new book has some information about that, but it's something, the feature is, is, is pretty new, so I guess uh, things are gonna build up as more, more people use it, uh, yeah.
Um, well, I've listed the, the advantages and disadvantages of using this method of describing a concept based on a specific implementation, but I think the best way to go about it is um, just, you know, um, work with it as you go along. And like writing a good concept is hard and it requires you to um, um, constantly expand it. That's, there, there is a best practice that said uh, use a standard concept. Uh, if, if, there's exists, if there exists a standard concept that models what you want, uh, then use it, except instead of writing your own. But in this, in this example, we didn't have any. So we have to somehow define it. And um, yeah, it's a gradual process, I guess. Yeah, if you write a uh, concept, the concept name with all the with all the arguments for all the parameters, it evaluates to a boolean. Okay. Last question. Writing documentation from concepts, is that what you're asking? Um, I, guess, I guess you could write a Clang tool like, that does that um, based on uh, Clang's interpretation of concepts. For example, uh, C-Lion does that, something similar. It generates auto-completion from concepts. Okay, thank you. <laughs>